war in the South Atlantic. 41 days of fighting that proved the Harrier. War in which one nuclear-powered submarine held an entire Navy at bay. A limited war fought under unique conditions by two sides unprepared for it. A war fought by Argentinian pilots untrained for attacking ships. A land war fought largely at night. A war of indelible night images. A war finally won by the British ability to force march over difficult terrain and by their superior infantry tactics. Argentina had long claimed the Falkland Islands and believed Britain too far away to prevent an invasion. Also at stake was possession of important areas in mineral-rich Antarctica. And Britain developed the longest supply lines of any war to retake the islands. April the 2nd, 1982, an Argentinian flag flies over the Falkland Islands. Argentinian Marines in their Amtrak amphibious vehicles begin the confrontation that brought the first war between so-called Western nations for 40 years. Operativo Azul, Operation Blue, was named for the sea, the sky and the robe of the Virgin Mary, guardian spirit of the Argentinian forces. The invaders arrived believing they were liberating the Falklands from colonial rule. Local reactions indicated otherwise. Originally, they planned to withdraw straight away, hoping simply to generate sympathy for their long-standing claim on the islands. But domestic need for a triumph of arms decided them to stay. Replacements arrived in a seemingly endless succession of Hercules and Air Force Boeing 707s. Ex-brigade from Buenos Aires province, well-equipped but comprising thousands of Chicos, the boy conscripts who served a year's compulsory national service. With them, the first Argentinian command muddle. Three brigadier generals now vied for control. They also brought in squadrons of the deadly Pucará ground attack planes that had proved so successful in counter-insurgency roles. Tanks never featured in the eventual defence of Port Stanley. It would be a key to Argentinian tactics that their experience was as a politicised anti-terrorism force, unused to facing a professional army trained to NATO standards. Sure that Britain would do nothing, the Argentinians now withdrew the crack marines who spearheaded the invasion. The desolate Falklands dependency of South Georgia. This is where forces came together to make conflict inevitable. Britain's Antarctic support ship Endurance was due for withdrawal leaving the island unprotected. Here at the deserted town of Leith, an Argentinian scrap metal dealer had won a contract to dismantle four disused whaling stations. Trouble began when the men were joined by a squad of Argentinian marines. Argentina, which had wanted to delay invasion until the southern winter, felt forced to bring it forward when Britain demanded withdrawal. Within a few days, Argentinian reinforcements arrived and raised their flag. The ensuing conflict brought two quite different military commanders face to face. General Galtieri had been president for three months, but faced mounting domestic protest over 100% inflation and falling wages. A man of action rather than foresight, he hatched a plan to seize the Falklands to divert public attention, believing Britain was no longer interested in defending them. Nonetheless, he was a soldier's soldier, commanding great loyalty from his troops. Admiral Sir John Fieldhouse was Britain's overall commander, but because he ran the distant battlefields from a control room in a London suburb, he got little credit at the time for being a clear-thinking strategist. Also, his extensive combat experience in World War II enabled him to steady jittery politicians during battlefield reverses. Admiral Fieldhouse's old ship, HMS Hermes, spearheads British Task Group 318 to regain the Falklands. 
designed to carry to battle the Royal Marine Commando Brigade with their necessary assault helicopters, she was packed with seven extra Sea Harriers and a squadron of anti-submarine seeking helicopters. Most of the brigade would follow in the cruise liner Canberra. Somber crowds bade farewell as behind followed the more modern cruiser carrier HMS Invincible. Instead of five Sea Harriers, she now carried eight, but the task group's 20 Sea Harriers would be outnumbered 10 to 1 by the Argentinian Air Force. A makeshift naval force boosted by the secret departure from Gibraltar of nine warships from a NATO exercise. They included three modern T-42 destroyers. Two HMS Sheffield and HMS Coventry would not return. HMS Plymouth would be at battle in just over three weeks. Three other frigates included the more modern HMS Arrow, whose sister ships Antelope and Ardent would be sunk by Argentinian bombs. HMS Antrim would join Plymouth in retaking South Georgia, while sister ship HMS Glamorgan would withstand a land-based Exocet missile attack. Altogether, 52 seamen would die in these ships. Sir Galahad left Britain next day, her name now synonymous with the task force's worst disaster. The amphibious landing ship HMS Fearless would spearhead the assault on the beaches of San Carlos. The North Sea Ferry, Norland, carried the 2nd Parachute Battalion to its decisive battles on the Falklands. And with considerably more pomp, Canberra sailed with the 3rd Commando Brigade. At sea, the techniques of battle were honed, a flare hunted by a Sidewinder missile. These would be a major success of the war, downing more Argentinian aircraft than any other ordnance. The Harriers practiced the ground support that would turn future land battles. Deadliest of all, the cluster bomb. It broke Argentinian resistance at Goose Green. Just one company of Marines sailed with Hermes, their practice runs serving propaganda purposes as much as sharpening skills. Troops used up 37 years of practice rounds preparing for combat. Anti-tank rockets would be devastating trench clearance weapons. We probably have to face uh, the Air Force, and I don't know how much they will wish to use of it. I'm actually pretty confident that we've got jolly good systems for dealing with them. This is no sort of puff. Um, we actually have some very good weapon systems and sensors in the force, and uh, some jolly good aircraft, uh, missile systems, all that sort of thing, which is well able to deal with that. It's been designed to do it. I think it's pretty good. I think they'd be very ill-advised to try and take us on because they'll suffer some very severe losses. Uh, I would put our chances as being considerably better than the opposition's. Task Group Commander Sandy Woodward he'd later describe the conflict as a close-run thing. Ascension Island in mid-Atlantic, halfway to the Falklands and the vital staging post for supply and resupply. This was where the 100 ships of the task force could swap hastily loaded stores.
more poured into the huge airbase leased from Britain by the Americans, a staging post now becoming the world's busiest airport. War's longest ever supply line would run efficiently throughout the conflict. Regrouping and diplomatic attempts to prevent war kept some ships there for many days, but meanwhile the spearhead group headed south. Britain now imposed a total exclusion zone to deter Argentinian reinforcements and launched Operation Paraquet to retake South Georgia and increase pressure on the Argentinians to withdraw. The battle group heads deeper into the South Atlantic, now one of three formations comprising 13 warships and four supply ships. Alongside Hermes, her watchdog, the frigate Broadsword, with its sophisticated Seawolf anti-air attack missiles. The heavy destroyer HMS Antrim had already been detached, destination South Georgia. There, a barrage from HMS Plymouth, aimed into surrounding hills, ensured Argentinian surrender without a fight. But not before the SAS had suffered a near disaster, crashing two helicopters in a dangerous landing behind Argentinian positions. The Argentinian submarine Santa Fe had landed 40 Marines as reinforcements before being disabled by British helicopters and beached at Gritviken. When Royal Marines landed, the Argentinians surrendered without a shot being fired. The British had regained South Georgia just 22 days after the Argentinians captured it. The first action of a war 7,000 miles from home had ended with 190 Argentinians taken prisoner, including the 38 scrap metal workers who started it all. As the spearhead of the British task group entered the total exclusion zone, the Argentinian Navy was detected in what appeared to be a three-pronged attack. To neutralize this threat, the nuclear-powered submarine Conqueror was ordered to attack the Argentinian cruiser Belgrano, considered the closest danger. Massed Argentinian air attacks provided the walls only air-to-air -air combat. More effective was the air-launched Exocet missile attack against the task group's radar picket ship HMS Sheffield. The battle group entered the total exclusion zone on May Day. Sea Harriers prepare for their first combat bombing Port Stanley Airport. But first, that runway was hit by one of 21 bombs from a lone Vulcan bomber, flying from Ascension and being refueled seven times on the way. It involved coordinating a fleet of nine Victor air tankers to refuel themselves as well as the V-Force bomber. Operation Black Buck 1 was designed to prevent the airfield being used by Argentina's high-performance jets, confining them to mainland bases and severely limiting their effectiveness. Soon after the Vulcan turned north, the air controller on Hermes cleared his Harriers for takeoff. At the time, the number involved was kept secret, but it's now known that the raid was carried out by nine Harriers, four from Hermes and five from Invincible. One hundred and sixty miles further east, still dawn in Port Stanley. The Argentinian invaders had remained undisturbed here for four weeks. Then the Harriers swooped in. 
In classic figure of eight formation, they evaded anti-aircraft measures with surprise and speed. The whole raid lasted just over a minute, but there would be 500 more. They were too low to cause serious damage to the runway, but a fuel dump was set on fire and some buildings were damaged. The Sea Harriers returned virtually unscathed and were landed quickly, being short of fuel. In two other operations the same day, Sea Harriers had also attacked Goose Green, destroying five Argentinian Pucaras. Later that day, three task groups of the Argentinian Navy were detected mounting an apparent pincer attack on the British battle group. The biggest threat was their flagship, the aircraft carrier Veinte Cinco de Mayo, with its eight Skyhawk fighter bombers. In the event, these jets were prevented from taking off by unsuitable weather. But the force also included two T-42 destroyers, sister ships to three in the British task group and armed with Exocet missiles. These were moving in two formations from the north. To the south, the nuclear-powered submarine HMS Conqueror had detected the third group led by the old cruiser Belgrano. The British had already warned that they would sink any Argentinian warship deemed a threat and reasoned that this might prevent their navy entering combat. Two Mark 8 torpedoes were fired. The Belgrano sank in 45 minutes with the loss of 368 lives, but the rest of the Argentinian navy took no further part its Skyhawks transferred to shore to fight at ranges that put them at a disadvantage. Conqueror's skipper, Commander Christopher Reeford Brown, explained his action. She uh, was a threat to the task force. She'd been steaming towards them, and I'd been watching her for a few hours beforehand, and uh, under direct orders, I went in and attacked her. Was it I think by doing so, um, although there was obviously loss of life on her, which I regret, I certainly saved considerable loss of life from the British task force. May the 2nd, HMS Sheffield on the horizon and on fire, hit by an Exocet missile. Launched by air 20 miles away, it took two minutes flying at the speed of sound. 24 men were injured and 20 died, most casualties caused by fire from unspent rocket fuel. The human cost was the result of economies. These T-42s had been shortened to save money, leaving no space for the sophisticated Seawolf missile system. It had therefore proved vulnerable to air attack, despite being specifically designed for anti-aircraft picket duty. May the 21st, seven weeks after the original Argentinian invasion, commandos of three brigade began landing at San Carlos. They were unopposed. The Argentinians had been convinced Britain would land close to the capital, Port Stanley, as they had done. And as men and material continued to pour onto the beaches, the Argentinians were encouraged to believe this by a series of diversionary raids. In the anchorage itself, there was little room for naval escorts. Most remained out in Falkland Sound as the May the 21st gun line to protect the landings against air raids. Canberra would take all day to disembark her Royal Marine Commandos. Giant Mexifloats brought in heavy equipment. Wessex and Sea King helicopters would lift over 400 tonnes of guns and stores before the end of the day. Ashore, men dug into the soft peat. This would be home for a week, and wet trenches would cause great discomfort.
combat engineered tanks carved out strong points while troops settled in quietly, marvelling at the lack of opposition. It was to come from the air. Argentinian Skyhawk spearheaded mass strikes on the forces now assembled in San Carlos water. On Hermes, 130 miles from the beachhead, Harriers prepared to intercept. Despite only having 20 minutes on combat air patrol, the Harrier was responsible for downing 23 Argentinian aircraft, mainly with Sidewinder missiles. Ground defence rapier missiles picked up the action. There's an air battle going on to the north. Air battle to the north. Two Skyhawks swoop over the beachhead, the first of five hours of attacks by 60 aircraft. Almost always they came in low and fast, but this often prevented their British-made Mark 17 bombs from exploding. The anchorage had been chosen so that Argentinian aircraft would have difficulty lining up on individual ships. Canberra's near misses and those of other ferries speeded up offloading of troops so that civilian vessels could rejoin the carrier group, allowing more warships in to defend the landings. The Argentinians lost 13 aircraft during these raids. In the coming week, 130 further sorties would be launched by the Argentinians. A near miss for HMS Yarmouth. She was one of the few gunline ships to emerge unscathed from Bomb Alley. HMS Antelope was hit on May the 23rd. Attacked by six Skyhawks, one of 12 bombs bounced off the sea, holding the ship but failing to explode. But it did explode during defusing, causing a fire. It took two hours to remove the crew, then the Seacat magazine exploded. Antelope's destruction again emphasized weaknesses due to cost saving. These Type 21s were originally conceived as low performance ships for foreign fleets like Iran's, with a widespread use of plastics that aided the spread of fire. Another lesson was the urgent need for an integrated long and short range air and missile defense to combat saturation air attacks. And mass Argentinian air attacks continued. A sea dart missile hunts its prey before another attack homes in. Reconnaissance helicopters shelter from attack. As the escorts hit back, many ships were lucky to be hit by bombs which did not explode. The commando carrier Sir Lancelot was one, towed to safe anchorage for the bomb to be defused. News of mounting ship losses sharply increased political pressure for an early breakout on land. First, instead of using helicopters as the Argentinians expected, 
British troops walked to Port Stanley along three arduous overland routes. Second, two Paris swooped on the important Argentinian base at Goose Green, sparking progress that would lead to tragedy at Fitzroy. Goose Green was a turning point. The six-phase British assault quickly overran outlying Argentinian positions, but faltered at their main defence line. Two Paris commander was killed at Darwin Hill, then the Argentinians were outflanked at Boca House. Two Paris momentum then took them to the airfield as Argentinian reinforcements arrived, but after a fierce firefight, two para outflanked them. The battle lasted 15 hours, night and day, because SAS observers had been unable to assess the strength of Argentinian defences. The debris of the first land action, the only battle to spill over into daylight hours with the disadvantage of fighting on the open Falklands terrain. Good infantry work and handling of weapons without much outside support had defeated a well-defended position. Yet despite the ferocity of the encounter, only 72 died, 55 Argentinians and 17 British. Bad weather prevented airstrikes until late in the battle. When they did come, Argentinian resistance crumbled fast. Their strong points fell because they'd been badly planned and were unable to afford themselves mutual protection. Only the final surrender revealed just how outnumbered the British forces had been. Over 1,500 Argentinians were taken prisoner, three times as many as expected. They didn't include their commander. He telephoned his orders from a safe house in Stanley. The presence of Pukhara ground attack planes had discouraged the tactic of a helicopter-borne assault. They had also been used to drop napalm, a futile weapon in open territory. To the north, 4-5 Commando had begun the long trek into the mountains overlooking Port Stanley. Loss of helicopter transports when the Atlantic conveyor was sunk made this forced march inevitable. The commandos called it yomping. It was tough going. In the first 13 hours, they covered only 14 miles. Where it was not boggy, tufted grass turned ankles. Marching at night was even worse, especially for those at the end of a queue of 600 men stumbling over the uneven ground. Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships braved air attack to speed supplies to the forward areas while Marines again dug defensive positions. Sunday, May the 30th, the weather closes in to protect Canberra's return to San Carlos water to deliver five brigade to the battlefield. Three thousand two hundred men of the Gurkhas, Scots and Welsh Guards trooped over rickety jetties. These men, representing the army, as opposed to the largely naval forces so far involved, would deploy through Goose Green to establish the southern front. The army's anxiety to get involved in the fighting alongside the marines would lead to tragedy. Complete absence of Argentinian opposition would quickly lead them through Darwin and onto a place called Fitzroy. But behind the calm, supply lines were becoming desperately stretched. Any means possible were now being used to speed 5 Brigade into forward positions, matching 3 Brigade in the north. But to move troops and stores in sufficient numbers, bigger ships were needed. The commando carriers, Sir Tristram and Sir Galahad. The island's coaster was not enough. At Fitzroy, clearer weather allowed Argentinian spotters a view of the new beachhead and the relaxing battalions. They called in an airstrike. Three Argentinian Skyhawks attack Sir Galahad, still packed with Welsh guards.
20 tons of ammunition exploded in the open tank deck where most troops were concentrated. 43 died and 150 were badly burned. Seeking helicopters flew into the thick smoke to lift men off. The guards had been due to sail onto Bluff Cove and their commanders had kept them on board rather than face an overland march and separation from their heavy equipment. Helicopter downdrafts steered life rafts away from the inferno. The raid inflicted the greatest losses of the war on British forces and the Welsh guards took no further part in the conflict. Despite the losses, British forces were now poised to move on Stanley itself from the highest ground. To do so, they fought their way through a series of mountain battles. These took them to the very edge of the capital, precipitating a sudden collapse in Argentinian resistance. First, the Argentinian defences were engaged by the 105mm howitzers of the 29th Commando Regiment, who'd been airlifted onto Mount Kent. Initial targets were enemy hilltop positions outside Stanley, and they fired up to 500 rounds a day with an accuracy that played a strong part in the final collapse of Argentinian morale. Score surrendered as the perimeter defences, manned mainly by the Chicos, crumbled under the barrage. From the south, too, artillery homed in on Argentinian positions guarding the approaches to Stanley. Using supercharge and laser rangefinders, the guns could pinpoint the strategic heights of Sapper Hill and key positions in Stanley itself. Under enemy fire, officers on Two Sisters Mountain plotted their attacks. A key assault weapon would be the Milan anti-tank missile. Argentina's greater firepower proved relatively ineffective because they failed to concentrate it accurately. Most of the key mountain battles were at night to avoid the problems of fighting on open Falklands terrain in daylight. On successive nights, Mounts Longdon, Harriet, Tumbledown and Wireless Ridge fell in fierce infantry assaults. Suddenly, 25 days after the landings, Argentinian resistance broke and the news passed rapidly along the columns of Marines negotiating minefields outside Stanley. We're beaten up now. No more open fire. No, no more active fire. No more open fire. They had overcome 11,000 well-armed troops with better coordination and leadership and better use of support weapons. We're safe weapons. The British infantry assaults had been marked by excellent use of well-practiced tactics and initiative from non-commissioned officers. Once ashore, they never lost a battle. Yet of forces numbering some 10,000 men, just 1,300 had come into frontline contact with the Argentinians, and they had won through by combining speed and aggression with the unexpected moves of indirect tactics. And this relatively small number took nearly 13,000 prisoners in a conflict that still seemed to some observers like two bald men fighting over a comb.